Then Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but holy, but holy trust the Jesus' name. My hope, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but holy, but holy trust is Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong, in the Savior's love, through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. And He's Lord of your life today, amen. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, here we go, my anger holds within the veil. Sing it loud. us in our joy by giving us joy and he helps us in our sadness by giving us what joy you know why because in Hebrews it says that Jesus was anointed with the oil of joy I picture Jesus smiling all the time you wonder why Jesus was invited to the wedding in Canaan I picture he was just this guy that everyone liked to be around he just smile and people are like man how great this guy is little did they know that he is God so let's sing this morning, knowing who he is, how great is our God. The 
the splendor, the splendor of the King, clothed, clothed in majesty. Let all the earth rejoice, let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice, and trembles at his voice. Here we go. How great is our God. Sing it. Sing with me. How great is our God.
Are you going to help me preach? Oh, you're going to help me preach. Awesome. You guys there for a treat? You know what? Uh, we were singing that song. It reminds me of uh, there's something about that name. And uh, some of you heard that recitation that goes along with that. It's not in the songbook, but it is. I've heard a singing group uh, do that part of it. And it simply goes like this. Jesus, the mere mention of his name can calm the storm. Heal the broken. Raise the dead. At the name of Jesus, sin, heart, men melt. Derelicts are transformed in the lights of hope are back in the eyes of a hopeless child. At the name of Jesus, hatred and bitterness turn to love and forgiveness. Arguments cease. I've heard a mother softly breathe his name at the bedside of a child delirious with fever and I've watched that little body grow quiet and the fever draw cool. At the name of Jesus, Emperors have tried to destroy it. Philosophies have tried to stamp it out. Tyrants have tried to wash it from the face of the earth with the very blood of those who claimed it, yet still it stands. And there shall be that day when every voice that has ever uttered a sound, every voice of Adam's race shall raise in one great mighty chorus to proclaim the name of Jesus. For you see, it just wasn't a mere coincidence that caused an angel one night to say to a virgin maiden, His name shall be called Jesus. Jesus. Yes, there is something about that name. Amen. Well, the sermon that's in your title of your lesson today will have to wait. Um, God wakes me up sometimes. Sometimes it's our shih tzus that wake me up every single night, barking at nothing. Uh, we have this big patio door in our back of our house there, and they can see the backyard. Uh, and sometimes they do bark and stuff. Uh, one night I got up, and Lexi, the smallest of the two shih tzus, uh, she's barking, and I look out the window, and there's a possum walking around our trash can. And... Uh, and of course, she was barking then, but there she just barks at anything. Um, and so I'm going to get some curtains and I'm going to put over that, that patio window so they can't see out. I, I just up to here with it. But you know, sometimes God wakes me up and He changes my mind. And it was kind of funny in the prayer room, Sister Tracy was praying, Now, Lord, I know sometimes you change Pastor Buddy's mind, and it already had happened, all right, by the way. Four o'clock this morning, He's like, Here's the sermon you're going to preach. So I have no PowerPoint. All right, here's your PowerPoint. What now? <laughs> All right, can everybody see that? All right, so I'm going to jump up there real quick and stick it on the ball. No, I'm not going to do that at all. Uh, but what now? Um, you know, last week we had an awesome celebration, and it was uh, from the top to the bottom. It was just a, just a way cool celebration. Yeah. Um, and it was, uh, I believe everybody got blessed by the singing and Everybody got blessed by the, the mortgage burning thing. And uh, we had one that was at a mortgage burning before, but everybody else had never been to one. So, no, you know, it was just, uh, and then I got great response on, on my Facebook page and on my YouTube channel from when I shared the, shared the video. Um, and it just, just was an overwhelming positive ex response to that day. I said all that to say this. The Lord woke me up this morning and he said, what now? What now? You see, a lot of people, they, they get through, a, and it's almost like a, uh, you're building up to something. And, and it, those of you who have uh, uh, had children that are going through school and you get to high school and you, the entire year you, you go financially destitute because there's always a check to write because the child is graduating that year. And, and so, and then this, and it's not over yet because now you've got to plan the open house. And then there's another check to write to the, to the printer. There's a check to write to the caterer. There's a check to write to the tent guy and the chair guy and the table guy. There's all kinds of things in preparation for this celebration for the child that's graduating high school. They think that they just went through the hardest time of their life. <laughs> <laughs> the yoke's on you. <laughs> 
And then the question begs asked when the child graduates, what now? Everybody asks, well, what are you going to do when you graduate high school? What are you going to do? And then they go to college. And, and, you know, some people just go to college for their entire life. And many times if you're an educator in here, you have to go. It's one of those things. You have to get that thing and put it in your book because if you don't have it, then they want to give you that pay raise. Then they can pass you over for all kinds of things. But the question begs asked many times when we achieve things in the crescendo, if you will, what now? What do we do now as a church? God has allowed us to accomplish great things. God has allowed Liberty Church to accomplish wonderful tasks that have been set before us in spite of the enemy trying to destroy Liberty Church over the years. We've had folks that have stood in the gaps when things hit the church like a ton of bricks. And God has still maintained his blessing upon this building and this ministry. And so after last Sunday, and I woke up, woke up this morning and God said, what now? Where do we go from here? What do we do? Uh, and I, I'm going to travel down a path of Jesus get, got invited to a supper. Pastor Jared was talking about he was invited to the marriage of Cana because everybody wanted to be around him. But I want to tell you in Luke chapter 14, if you want to take your Bibles and turn there in Luke chapter 14, we'll find another supper that he got invited to. But it wasn't a supper that he was invited to that he was a friend of those people who were inviting him to supper. We find in this passage of scripture that there was an underlying theme of why he was invited. He was invited to the house of the Pharisee to have supper. Anybody ever been, been to a supper that was kind of like, you got invited but you don't know why? Yeah. And then when you get there, you're like, yeah, I know why. <laughs> Jesus already knew why, by the way. But his foreknowledge. Let's see if we can read there for just a few moments here. Luke chapter 14. And I want to make, mention that Luke, out of all the Gospels, Luke alone um, records this occasion of the Lord Jesus going out to dinner at the house of one of the chief Pharisees. And of his giving his host and guests a lesson in etiquette and in the devastating parable of the ambitious guest. Luke also says that there are two other parables that he, he wrote in his passage in this chapter that are in no other gospel as well. The building of the tower and the king preparing to make war, which both relate to discipleship. And he concludes with the parable of the salt that has lost its tang. Let's read on. Luke chapter 14. We're going to read the entire chapter. Is that all right? Can you stay with me? And I want you to notice if you have a red letter edition, everywhere the words are written in red is Jesus actually speaking. Okay? So here we go. Luke chapter 14. And it came to pass, as he went into the house of one of the chief Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath day, that they watched him. I want you to capture that idea. They watched him. Anybody ever been uh, to dinner with somebody and there was a guest at the table and everybody was watching them? Maybe they were watching you. <laughs> um, I used to work with a guy and he's retired now. He retired a couple years before I did. and um, We would go to the uh, Golden Buffet, the Chinese restaurant up here in Dixie Highway. And he was, he was not a large man. Uh, he was probably a buck 80, maybe. But he would go to lunch with us and all the guys from the crew, the grounds crew and all the other custodians, so that we'd pick a Friday and we'd all meet at the Chinese restaurant and we would all watch him. <laughs> I never seen a guy could eat like that guy could eat. And to this, to this day, I've never seen a guy could eat like that. 
So when, every, when he would walk in, it was almost like a rock star was walking in because everybody was waiting for John to sit down with his plate and pile it on. And he'd go back, and he'd go back, and he'd go back, and he'd go back. He was one of those on the other side of that that we would watch. But in this case, we find here that Jesus went to the house of the chief Pharisee. Politician. He's getting political now. And they were all going to watch him. And so here's what went down. Let's look together. And behold, there was a certain man before him which had the drop seed. Now, as I read to you before, there was, uh, uh, in verse number one, they said that they were going to watch him. Now, I'll just ask you a question. Do you think the man with the drop seed was there by accident? What day were they? What day was it that they were eating? They were eating on the Sabbath. So here you go. So they they invited Jesus to the Pharisees' house that they might do what? Trap him. All right. And so here we go. And Jesus answering. See, already Jesus already knew. He already knew. He's God. I don't know, I don't really think they captured that whole idea that he was God in the flesh. But Jesus already knew the intent of their heart. And here it is. Jesus answering and speak unto the lawyers and the Pharisees, saying, By the way, Jesus didn't go to law school. Jesus didn't graduate from seminary. Jesus didn't go to Bible college. And neither did any of his disciples, by the way. But yet he was invited into the company of the chief Pharisee and lawyers. You know what Billy Carter said? You know what a th you call a thousand lawyers at the bottom of the ocean? A good start. I didn't say it, Billy Carter. And Jesus answered and spoke to the lawyers and Pharisees and says, It is lawful. Is it lawful? Now, once again, he knew the intent of their heart. And he knew what they were thinking already. And he says, Um... Is it lawful uh, to heal on the Sabbath? And they held their peace. They didn't say anything. Bless you, brother. And he took him, and he healed him, and he let him go. So he healed the man, and he let him go. And answered them, saying, Now Jesus, after he healed him, because they didn't say anything, and he knew what they had him there for, that they might trap him. And they had this guy, he was a, I'm going to say he was a plant, yep. that they might trap him. And he healed them. Hey. And here we go. He said, and he answered them, saying, Which of you, having an ox, having an ass or an ox, and it falls into a pit, and will not go straightway and pull him out on the Sabbath? And they couldn't answer those things. Jesus simply said, listen, you are very important people. You lawyer there, you probably got your nice, beautiful Lincoln Continental. And you right there, you chief priest, you probably got one of those beautiful brand new Escalades that they came out with the big giant taillights in the back. And then driving down and tooling around. Now, if you had a flat tire on the Sabbath, you're not going to get out of your car and have that thing changed. No, you're going to do it. You're going to change that tire because you got to get to where you're going. And so Jesus kind of shut their mouth and they tried to trap him in the area of healing on the Sabbath. He made him clam up. I'll get to my sermon here in just a few moments. But I want to paint you a picture of what we're dealing with here. We're at supper now. Big supper. Big giant table. Several guests around the table. And then when he had put forth a parable to those which were bidden, when he marked how they chose out the chief rooms, saying unto them, When thou art hidden of any man to a wet, bidden of any man to come to a wedding, and sit in, uh, sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden to come. And when he had bathed thee there, him and came and said to thee, Give this man place that thou with an, in shame to take another lowest room. But when thou art bidden to go and sit down in the lowest room. That when he that hath bade them come, he may say unto thee, Friend, go up higher. 
Then shalt thou have worship in the presence of them that has sit and meet with thee. For whosoever exalts himself shall be abased, and he that humbles himself shall be exalted. Simply stated this. Yesterday we uh, uh, made a trip up to Lapeer, me and Brother Don and Brother Doug, and uh, we went up and spent the day up at the gravel pit up there. And uh, when we got in the truck, now both the fellows are going to be a guest of my truck. Brother Don said, Doug, you can ride shotgun. That's cool. Don had rode shotgun several times before. That's the first time Doug had been with us up to a little trip that we go up to the gravel pit. And Don says, I want you to ride shotgun. That was cool. Jesus is simply saying, listen, when you're invited to an event, see back then they didn't have place cards. Right now, the wedding things now, they have place cards and you got to get your place card off the table and you're like, and then you go find your seat, all right? They didn't have that back then. And so what Jesus is simply saying this, don't think of yourself more than what you are. And he says, listen, when somebody invites you somewhere, take the lowest seat because what happens is you're going to be thoroughly embarrassed when you sit down in the chief seat and the chief uh, the pre chief priest comes up and he says, listen, I, I'm sorry, you're going to have to move down because i got somebody more important than you coming. Jesus says, take the lower seat. Because when the, when the fellow who invited you, he may invite you to come and sit next to him. And can you imagine this picture of this room here? Jesus is kind of giving them more picture and he's chastising them because many of the leaders in that room, because they were reclining on couches, they didn't have chairs like we have today, they reclined on couches and we have three couches on one side of the table and then we have several couches on this side of the table and seven more on, all the way around. And so what would happen is that the younger ones, the younger Pharisees, would race to get to the chief seats, the better seats. And usually on the corners is where the best seats was at. Can you imagine some old Pharisees trying to get into the room when the, they say, soup's on. You know, Pharisee, he's stumbling on, over himself and he's trying to get to the seat and he just didn't quite make it. And he got cheated out of some of the better seats just simply because he wasn't able to move as quick as he used to. And so Jesus is, once again, the room fell silent because he's kind of chastising them and they're, they're weighing how they were getting to the table and he's trying to give them an instruction. It's better to give way to somebody else than it is to take and say, you know what, that's my seat. Look how important I am. And so if you want to exalt yourself, you have your reward. For it's better to give way to others because God will lift you up. And uh, just simply like yesterday, Doc could have simply jumped in the front seat. He had seniority. He rode in the front seat before. But on this event, he says, Doug, you ride shotgun. And that was cool with me. Because that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to give way to a guest. And that's the way things happen. Let's, let's move quickly forward. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Now, concerning invited people, then he said unto them, uh, him also that bade him, when thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends, nor thy brethren, nor neither thy neighbors, let they also bid thee again, and recompense be made. But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. Jesus is simply giving us a word picture here. He's telling these cats, quit being so political and just have a little calypic circle of friends. And you know what he says? You need to go out and you need to look for those that are less fortunate than you and take care of them. And you will be blessed. Verse 15. And when one of them that sat at me with him heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. And then said he unto him. <laughs> Do you think the guy was really, you know, trying to, trying to really be a cheerleader for Jesus at this point? Absolutely not. Yeah, he, he's just, his vain words. 
Vain words. And Jesus understood these vain words. And he simply, he chastised him and rebuked him. He says, a certain man made a great supper and bade him many. And sent his servant at supper time to say to them, we'll get to my sermon, by the way, in just a few minutes, all right? I'm building the back story here. And sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one accord, or one uh, consent, began to make excuse. The first said to him, I bought a piece of ground. And I must needs go and see it. I pray thee have me excused. And another says, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee, how can you plow at nighttime in the way? He says, I go to prove them. I pray thee that you would have me excused. And another says, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. Yeah, that's, that's an excuse. He says, yeah, I've seen her wife. I've seen his wife. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servants, Now go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in them hither the poor, the maimed, the halt, and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done, as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And here's our key verse today, to our title of our sermon. What now? And the Lord said, Unto the servant, go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. That's our job, friends. That's what's now. That's what's now. You see, a lot of folks give excuse on why they can't do some things. There are a lot of folks that give reason. The one fellow says, he says, well, listen, I, I, I bought some ground and, and, and I need to go out and, and till that ground. And another fellow says, well, I've married a wife. And he says, I can't make it. I want you to have, have me excused. And, and then he's, he's, all these folks are making excuses on why they cannot come to the supper. It's time for us as Liberty Church folks to quit making excuses on why we can't serve God. It's time for us because it's, what now means is that all the festivities are behind us. There are some more festivities to come, but right now we have to get busy in this work of the kingdom that we need to go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in that his house might be full. You see, I could fill the house up between... Uh, Glad to have Brother Mike here this morning with us, one of our guests. And uh, I had all four pastors here this morning. And he said, boy, you guys got a lot of pastors. <laughs> That's great. I could have all, all four of us come up here at different times and preach a different sermon about easy believism. Yeah. And we could fill the place up. But I want to tell you something. A person who commits himself to Jesus Christ, the life is going to be tough. Because later on in this passage of Scripture, we see a builder that sets, it, uh, gets ready to build something. And Jesus, in that passage, he says, you know, a builder does not begin to build without counting the cost first. Because it's going to cost something. Christian friend, if you're walking through this life, you might be a believer, but a believer not necessarily is always going to be a disciple. I've run into a lot of believers. In my lifetime, I have ran into several hundred, if not thousands of folks who are believers, but yet not disciples. And so today, what now means is that now we need to quit stop just being a believer and we need to become disciples for the kingdom of God. That God's house might be full. Be a disciple in your neighborhood. Let people know who you trust. Be a disciple at your job. Don't be afraid to let your light shine through. Be a disciple out in the world. Be a disciple at the grocery store that his house might be filled. 
Take every opportunity that you have that God opens the door for you because what now means that we need to start getting busy with this business of serving God. Because the time will come when no man can work. Because there will be a time that the end of time when we find that it will be the last person that gets saved. And this world will change forever. A lot of folks says, well, what now, Pastor Buddy? Well, we read in verse number 19, another said, I have bought a five yoke of oxen and I go to prove them. Another said, I have married a wife before I can come. Why didn't that guy says, you know what, honey, let's go. We got to go. Let's go together. No, he, he treated her like she was an albatross. And so the servant came back and told him, and Jesus said, the servant said, go out to the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in. And there went a great multitude. Uh, let's see, let's, let's read verse number 24. For I say unto you that none of these men which were hit, which were bidden shall taste of my supper. You see, this is a severe statement that Jesus has given him. If you reject God's invitation, he has no choice but to reject us. Jesus goes on to say, And there went great multitude with him, and he turned out and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters and yea, his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. You see, these verses here, verse 25 to 27, these verses are simply saying that we should put God first. Put God first. A lot of folks says, well, you know what? I'll go to church if I don't have anything else to do. Or I'll go to church and I'll do this if I don't have anything else to do. I'll read my Bible as long as I don't have anything else to do. I'll do this as long as I don't have anything else to do. There are a lot of folks who make a lot of excuses. Let me read to you what Dr. McGee talked about. Let me see if I can, I underlined it here. Regarding what an excuse is. And I'll find it here directly. What is an excuse? Excuse. What's an excuse? Is it the truth? Really? If we've told somebody an excuse rather than the truth, the, tr the excuse is what? A lie. A lie. So let's quit making excuses. Because just like at the beginning, when Jesus got invited to the supper, he already knew the intent of everybody in that room, what they planned on doing. They planned on to trap him. They planned on to trap him on the Sabbath day. And they, they actually wanted to demean his character. And then he told a parable about those who made excuse. It really wasn't. They, they just made something up. Well, I can't right now. Well, I, I, you know, I got to go here, I got to go there, I got to do this, I got to do that. We need to quit being just believers and be disciples. Be disciples for the kingdom. That's the what now. Because when it's all said and done, what we do here on earth is when we stand before God on the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema seat. Because we will all give an account. What's an accounting? Anybody in here an accountant? Anybody? Account numbers? Anybody? All right. We give an accounting at the end of our life. We stand before God. Christian friend, you may be saved, you may be a, uh, a believer, but you may not be a disciple. And when we stand before God to give an account of what we did in this body, whether it be good or whether it be bad, whether we get rewards or whether we don't, how sad would it be to stand before our Lord and Savior at the beam of sea and He is not able to bestow any awards or crowns upon us because we were a believer, but yet we weren't a disciple. Let's start being disciples. Hey! Let our lights so shine before men. 
Amen? That they can see Jesus in us. So what now? What are you going to do with him now? We had a great celebration. We enjoyed great music. We had great festivities. What are we going to do now? You see, the parable about the tower builder reminds me of a story when we went to South Carolina. And out at the uh, uh, Charleston, South Carolina, we went right to the edge of the, of, of the uh, state right there, right in Charleston. You can see the ocean. And, and one of, we went on one of the tours, and out there in the middle of the water was a, a, a big, giant rock. And there was a beautiful, well, it started to be a beautiful hotel. And it was massive, big, giant concrete thing. Didn't have any windows or doors in it yet. And everybody, what is that right there? So, well, there was a builder one time, and he, he bought that little piece of land out there in the middle of the ocean, and it was going to be a, a grand hotel. And he, and he got the walls up, and he got the approval for everything else, but he ran out of money. And now it stands there in effigy of an actual builder who didn't count the cost. You see, it's going to cost you to be a disciple for the king. And it may cost you some friends. But I tell you what, if somebody leaves you because you believe in Jesus Christ, they weren't a real friend anyway. Because a friend will love you in spite of who you are. A friend will love you and sit with you through thick and through thin. But they'll also respect your beliefs. What now? I'm going to ask you a question. Is it your heart's desire to see people saved? I hope so. Is it your heart's desire that maybe one day that you can lead someone to Christ? I hope so. And then I'll ask you this question. Have you ever led anybody to Christ before? And I'm just asking. I don't want you to raise your hand or anything. But I want to ask you that. Have you ever led anybody to Christ personally? You want to you wanna talk about a huge boost to your spiritual ego? You lead somebody to Christ personally. You pray with them in your living room or at, in their house or maybe you're out at an event and you're able to pray with them and they come to know Jesus because you were there and you were able to help them invite Jesus into their life. That's way cool. And the only way that Liberty Church will continue to do. You see, there's a fellow who wrote a book. It's called The Autopsy of a Local Church. There's about three churches that come to mind right now in the city of Pontiac. That are really struggling right now. They're on life support. I'm talking about spiritual life support. There's three churches that come to mind in the city of Pontiac that, that I know personally. The churches are nearing closing the doors because they have lost what God had given us, and that is to be disciples and not just believers. They were comfortable with the idea of coming just to this place, just me and my friends and my little group or my little clique, and then this is set in my chair, and we can listen to the preacher, and he'll tell us a story and make us laugh, and he's going to have a few songs, and then we'll go and we'll go about our separate ways, and then we'll come back and do it all over again, and then we'll have a funeral occasionally, and they'll carry the body out, and then we'll have another funeral, we might have a wedding, maybe have a baby, but you know, as time goes on, there's more funerals than babies. And friends, if we don't invite folks to come in and give their heart to Jesus Christ and disciple the lost, autopsy is what's left for the local church that turns itself inward. <laughs> And I pray that Liberty Church will continue to grow and continue to do great things for the cause of Christ. But your pastor cannot do it. Brother Knight, Pastor Knight can't do it. Pastor Jared can't do it. Pastor Eric can't do it. 
your deacons, your trustees that can't do it. It's going to take a group effort. Liberty is an awesome work, and I love being here at Liberty. I just love the name of Liberty because that's what Jesus did. He said, if I set you free, you are free indeed. Liberty. But in order for liberty to continue and to do, continue to do great and mighty and wonderful things in the, in the name of Jesus and for his honor and his glory that he might be glorified, we are going to have to quit being on our laurels and quit just being believers and start being disciples. When we walk out these doors and tell people about him. Pastor Buddy, what do I tell him? Just tell him what you did, what he did for you. So the what now is this. If we go out and we do what Jesus has asked us to do, go out on the highways and the heads and compel them to come in, that means a, that means, hi, how you doing? Man, it's good to see you today. How's the work been going? All right? Been going good? Good, good. Listen, I, I know you hear from me all the time, but you know what? We're going to have something special at church, and you know, you never know what's going to happen to that preacher. We got a crazy preacher once in a while. He'll climb on the furniture. You never know. But I'm going to invite you to come and be with church. Would you, would you, would you, would you consider it? Awesome, awesome. So, anyway, it's good seeing you again. Have a great day. That's all it takes. That's all it takes. Or sometimes, Brother Tim had a had a fellow who uh, who don't believe in Jesus. I think he does. So he was always getting on Brother Tim uh, about you know his faith and stuff. And so then uh, I had Tim tell this story in our class. Anyway, Tim works for a tree company, and he's the mechanic for the most, well, most part, the heavy mechanic takes care of the machinery. But then he gets a call from this guy. And the guy had buried the truck in this, somebody's backyard, just buried it all the way to the axle. This, this atheist who kind of be given Brother Tim some grief for his faith. So, say a good long sir. What did the guy say when you showed up to get him out? He says, it's because I don't believe in Jesus. Jesus is the one that sunk me in the mud here, isn't he? <laughs> he says, Jesus is the one who sunk me in the mud, wasn't he? And then Tim responded, No, you backed on soft ground. <laughs> <laughs> but you see what takes place is, you know, you can be a believer and you can have a light-hearted feeling regarding what Jesus, you don't always have to be dogmatic and beat on your Bible when you go talk to people about Jesus, but you can go to them and you can share the love of Christ with them and live your life before them so that one day they may come to you and they say, hey, listen, I, I'm going to go to the, that church that you've been inviting me to. Where is it located again? 3545 Johnson Road. All right. Hey, hey. <laughs> That's the what now. Let's stop being believers and become disciples. I'm sure I have a brief phrase. Let's stop being just believers and become disciples. I talked about winning someone to Christ personally. If that's your heart's desire, and I would say that ought to be your heart's desire, there's nothing, nothing in the world like it. You pray the Lord, send someone across my path that I could lead to you. Now, it may take you a little bit of time talking to them and witnessing to them to say, Lord, because you know why it's God's will. He says, not my will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Amen. And so you say, Lord, I want to lead someone to you. I want to lead just one to you. Do you know if each one wins one in this room, we double our attendance today. We have 150 people today. If each one win one. Isn't that cool? Hey. So if it's your heart's desire to win somebody to Christ, and I believe it ought to be, pray, Lord, send somebody across my path that I would be able to do that too. There's nothing, nothing in the world like it. I'll close with this thought. Several years ago, um, I, I got a phone call to go to uh, the hospital uh, to pray with a lady. Uh, her daughter and son-in-law came and attended church here. And so I went to the hospital and uh, I seen the lady and I didn't know if she was that bad. Her health was really, really bad. 
And so I went into the room and I, I met her husband. And I met her son. And I was meeting her for the very first time. And I shook her hand and she was had the oyster mask on. She's at uh, uh, McLaren downtown in, in Pontiac. And I began to talk to her and I began to talk to her about her faith. And she reassured me that the Lord was her Savior. That makes my work easy. And so over a period of time, we were able to get to the hospital and see her and got to know her husband. <coughs> well, they had moved her downstairs to the second floor. They had turned her over to hospice care. And I told them, I says, you know, I'll... Uh, I, I was with him that day, and I says, I'll, uh, I'm going to go get some lunch. I've been there for a while, and I, 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 I'm going to go get some lunch, and I'll be back. And then before I got to the McDonald's to meet Judy and the kids, um, they called me, and she had died. <coughs> and so I did her funeral, and um, then we, the, the widow, her husband came and sat back where Brother Mike sat back there. Um, and we went out to his house. He lived out in Oxford. Me and Brother Knight and Brother Bill. Brother Knight has got a beautiful way of talking to people about the Lord. How, how can you say no to that, that face up there? <laughs> Brother Richards was sitting in his chair. I call him brother, but at that time he hadn't accepted the Lord. And brother Knight was the quarterback. He's kneeling down next to Brother Richards talking to him about the Lord. And Brother Knight says, Pastor Buddy, you want to come over here? So Brother Knight stood up and I took his place. I took Brother Richards by the hand. And I look into the Lord. Pray with me. That's a highlight of my ministry. He was in his 80s. How cool is that? You don't get no cooler than that. I'm talking about that's cool. You want to say, I got a 1967 Corvette. That's cool. But leading someone to Jesus is way much cooler. Amen. That's the payoff when you become a disciple and not just a believer. You're able to have way cool experiences like that. And one of the hardest funerals I've ever preached was the preacher funeral, Brother Richards. Let me tell you about him. I don't care what kind of weather it was outside. He was on dialysis three times a week before he passed away. If he went in the hospital, he was here. You see those folks in there giving an excuse? Talking about a man who's late 80s, 87, 88 years old. He's on his walker. And he come and sat in the chair next to my office. On Wednesday night, he sat there, watch and greet everybody coming in. Being a disciple, not just a believer. I would like you to come and pray today. Say, Pastor Buddy, I've not been a disciple. I mean, you need to be. I'm a believer. I'm saved. I'm on my way to heaven. But I really need to work harder on this thing, being a disciple. Because the what now means that somebody's life might be hanging on us because of whether we act on or off what Jesus tells us to do or not. 
So when we walk out these doors, look at every opportunity that comes our way as an opportunity to tell somebody about Jesus. Amen. Every time. Brother Fred, every time we're somewhere and Fred's with me, or I'm with Fred, usually I'm with Fred. <laughs> I don't care where we're at, Brother Fred, he says, Hi, how you doing today? Oh, God, just get it's my pastor. It's my pastor. It's my pastor. <laughs> he uses every single opportunity to tell somebody, if and just by a byway, that this is my pastor. Because you know what that does? That opens the door. Or somebody else will say something about Jesus. Let's all stand together. Every head bowed, every eye closed. We're going to invite you to pray. Father, we love you. We thank you. What now? Lord, I know you have your hand upon Liberty Church. You have watched over her. You have protected her. There's folks in this room that you have emboldened with stick to itiveness to keep the doors open when the storms ravaged her. Father, we thank you for that. Now, Father, as we move into the next chapter of Liberty Church, I pray that you would help us be not just believers, but be disciples. And I pray that you would burden our hearts today. Folks in these pews would come to this altar and say, Lord, help me be a better disciple. I've not been the best disciple I need to be. And maybe someone says, I've been a believer, but I've not been a disciple. Help me be a disciple. And Lord, uh, help me to lead someone to you. If nothing else, invite him to church. And, and then when I see him take that walk to the altar, I'm able to go and wrap my arm around him and pray with them. Father, I pray that you would open people's hearts this morning to the wooing of your spirit, that they might find their place here at this altar, seeking your face, being better now than when we first came in. In Jesus' name, we invite you to come on the very first note. Why don't you come on? Yes.